uh, Chris to uh, Lutheran Church by the Lake. As I said, he's been in McCormick yeah. most of the weekend. So yeah, hey. thank you so much. Thank you. I have been here for a little while. I feel like this is my second home now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a blessing to be here, man. We uh, my fiance is here, my my son's here as well, and it's been a really really good time. So if you heard me speak so far, you know I asked everybody to stand up. So everybody stand up for me really quickly. Give somebody a hug that looks different than you and tell them you love them. <laughs> Come on, Pastor. Love you, brother. I love you so much. Love you. Come on in. Oh, I love you. Oh, I love you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Yes. Amen. Amen. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. One more. There we go. All right. Let me get a hug right here. Thank you so much. God bless you. All right. You guys, you guys can be seated. You may be seated. Uh, once you start the wave, it's tough to stop. <laughs> I know. I know. Got a lot of love going around now, baby. I love it. If you heard me speak yesterday, or if you're in high school and you heard me speak, you know why I do that. Builder, you know, the water bill, or whatever it may be, somebody's struggling to pay their card note, and they've been stressing, and they needed a hug. And I don't care if you're 5, if you're 55, 95, whatever it may be, I think everybody needs a hug. I think a hug is powerful, and it's simple, I know. There's a lot of power in it. And I think I love you. We throw that phrase around, but when we mean it, it's powerful as well. There's a stat that I always share is that 16.2 million people in the U.S. are struggling with depression. That's an awful lot of people that are struggling. As I've been here, I've been getting multiple messages from people at the high school. I usually like to give away my number and my social media to the high school students. I say, you know, if you ever need anything, if you're, if you're ever feeling down, please text me or message me. I think I've got about 17 or 18 messages. And actually this morning I was sharing with Pastor how a girl said, Chris, you know, I tried to commit suicide yesterday. And I was talking to her right before uh, service this morning. And she said, Chris, it's, it's just good to see that somebody has gone through tough things and they're still trucking forward. So when I speak and I speak about love and forgiveness, I also have to share with people how, how some kids and some adults are struggling with themselves. So I'm so honored to be here today and to talk to that girl. And I don't think it was an accident that I was here at McCormick this weekend. I don't think so at all. But what I first want to share with you guys, because I'm not going to be here all day. I heard we got an hour and then we're gone, okay? So I'm not going to be here all day, I promise. The first thing I want to share is how I think God is preparing us for our future battles. You know, oftentimes I hear people say, you know, Chris, I'm, I'm talking to God, but he ain't saying nothing back. You know, I've been listening, but I, I can't hear anything. I've been reading, but nothing hits me. I think sometimes we read a little bit too fast. I know I have. And we don't see what's right in front of our faces, and it's, it's so perfect for our lives at the time. And, you know, me growing up, I grew up in the church like a lot of people. But I didn't have that personal relationship with God until quite recent, recently, honestly. And growing up, you know, I, I thought God was like Santa Claus. I thought, you know, if I, if I was on the nice list and not the naughty list, I'd, I'd be blessed with whatever I asked for. I thought God was like a tooth fairy or something. I thought if, you know, I went to sleep, put a prayer under my pillow, the blessing would be there in the morning. That's what I thought. And I remember my freshman year of college, um, went to mid-major school. What that means is we, we're Division One, but we don't play the biggest schools. We don't play the... Clemson's every day. We don't play the South Carolinas every single day, but we play them a couple times out of the year. So when we do, obviously, it's the biggest game of the year. My freshman year, I was starting uh, in the outfield. As a freshman, I'm starting. I'm thinking I'm the man. I'm feeling good about myself. And we're headed to Clemson University to play Clemson. Got any Clemson fans? <laughs> Got a couple. Got a couple. We'll, we'll keep... We'll keep Keep that, that spirit alive when I tell this story, okay? <laughs> so we're headed to Clemson, and I'm a freshman. 
and I see one of my best friends writing a scripture on his wrist, I start thinking to myself, you know, you know, maybe if I write a scripture on my wrist, God's going to bless me with a good game. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. So I said, you know what, let me find something. So I pulled out my little Bible app on my cell phone. We all got it. So I started just scrolling. Ah, nah, I don't need, nah, I need something, need something. Come on now, come on now. And then something kind of smacked me in the face. The scripture is Proverbs 24.10. It says, if you falter in the day of adversity, how small is your strength? And I remember seeing that scripture, and I said, this is perfect for sports. This is perfect for baseball. Because if you know baseball, they say if you're successful three out of ten times, you got a chance to be a Hall of Famer. I'm still trying to figure out how to be successful those three times, to be honest with y'all. I ain't going <laughs> to lie. I'm trying to figure that out. But I saw it. I said, this is perfect for me. This is perfect for baseball. And so what I did was I prayed. I said, God, you know, if, if you're listening, hopefully you are, but can you please bless me with a couple hits today, maybe, you know, maybe I can make a diving catch. Hopefully we can beat Clemson University for the first time in school history. I said, God, if you do this, I'm going to give you all the glory, I promise. And I remember me playing that game. I wrote that scripture on my wrist, on my glove, on my helmet. I wrote it everywhere. We played Clemson University. had the best game of my life. I had four hits, two RBIs, two game-winning RBIs. A diving catch to end the game, and we beat Clemson University for the first time in school history. Ah. <laughs> so where my Clemson fans at? You know, <laughs> first time in school history. Uh. And I remember, you know, after the game, people were saying, Chris, you know, amazing game. You know, how did it happen? I said, hey, I wrote this scripture on my wrist. I promise I can't make this up. I said, God, if you're, here, if you're listening, I promise you I'm going to give you all the glory if you do this. And he did it all. But you know what I think? I think God knew my heart. He knew maybe if I didn't get those four hits, I wouldn't have remembered that scripture when I needed it the most. Because, of course, after that game, I wrote that same scripture on my wrist every game after it. But I realized that scripture wasn't given to me for baseball. I realized that scripture was given to me for June 17, 2015, a couple months later. I realized that scripture was given to me when I was sitting in a room and I was given the worst news of my life. I was told that my mom was shot and killed. And that scripture was ringing in my mind when I tried to call my father and he wouldn't answer. I didn't know whether I should call my brother and sister to tell them what happened. That scripture was given to me for June 17, 2015. And guys, what I'm going to be speaking today about is it's called Overcoming the Unthinkable Adversity with Love and Forgiveness. You know, oftentimes as Christians, you know, we think sometimes, you know, everything's going to be all right. And I think it will be. I think God's going to get us through it. We're going to go through some things during, during our lifetimes. I promise you that. And there's a, there's a, a scripture that I love that honestly points that out to us. You know, it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And it says when you face those trials. It doesn't say if. I don't think there's a typo there. I think we're going to go through some things. It's going to test our faith. But you got to be prepared for it. And the first thing I want to share with you guys when you're faced with overcoming adversity or anything in your life, you got to know it won't be easy. You guys are a lot more wise than I am now. You've gone through some things. I said I told him yesterday, I don't, I don't call you old. I call you wise. I get in trouble if I say that. You guys have been through a lot. I know, and I know it's true. And so have I in this young age. But I've realized that, you know, it, it won't be easy. Some things we're going to go through in our life is it's going to be really, really tough. I remember I was, you know, really, really down in my life and, I would watch these inspirational videos on YouTube. You guys know what YouTube is? Anybody know what YouTube is? All right. Just making sure I'm in the right place. So I was watching these, these videos on YouTube, and it was people speaking about going through tough things. And I loved it. And it's partly the reason why I'm a speaker today, because that stuff gave me hope. I remember watching these videos, and it was about a cancer survivor. But they didn't, 
show, you know, after she already survived it, they showed her initial reaction. Her initial reaction was like, why me, God? Why is, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me right now? And I was thinking the same exact thing at that point in my life. I was asking God, you know, why is this happening to my life? Why did it have to happen to my church? Why did it have to happen to my mom? And I remember keep, I was watching that video and her mom said something that's going to stick with me forever. She said, hey, I don't know why it's happening to us. I don't. To be honest, I don't even know how we're going to get through it. But I got faith that we will. Just know that it's not going to be easy. And so I kept that with me, realizing that whatever I go through, I know it's not going to be easy. But I got faith. I'm going to get through it. The second thing that I always share when I, when I talk about overcoming anything that life throws at us, you got to know you can't control everything. You know, sometimes I, I talk to people and they say, Chris, I, I think I'm so glad you're, 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 you're born in this generation because I think if you were born in the generation before you, your message would be really tough to get out. And I say, I think you're right. But I'm glad that I was born in the year that I was born in. And that's what I can't control. And I told the, the, the high school students the other day that I'm a Chicago Cubs fan now, obviously, because they drafted me. But growing up, I was like Pastor Kinsler. I was a Braves fan. I was a big time Braves fan. And I remember, you know, five years old, first time I ever experienced adversity. I was five years old and I wanted to go see a Braves game with my dad. So I asked my dad, you know, can we go see Braves game five years old? That's all I want to do for my birthday. He said, yes, sure thing, let's do it. I remember getting to my dad's Lexus and we were heading down the freeway and we got pulled over. I saw blue lights in the rearview mirror. Now, granted, I'm five years old, but I know something ain't right when I see those blue lights. <laughs> Something's going on. And so we get pulled over and, you know, the officer asked my dad, hey, sir, you've been drinking tonight. My dad says, no, I haven't been drinking. What's going on? He says, you sure you haven't been drinking? You've been swerving the last couple miles. You sure you haven't been? My dad says, no, I haven't been drinking. What's up? He says, well, what's in that cup? He pointed to the cup, and I scream, it's just Kool-Aid. In the back seat, I'm screaming, it's just Kool-Aid. I have no idea. Five years old, guys. I'm trying to save my father. He says, is that Kool-Aid? My dad said, yeah, it's Kool-Aid. He said, all right, well, let's, can you step outside the car for me? My dad does this. You know, he make, puts him through the whole DUI thing, makes him walk in a straight line, say this backwards, say that backwards, or whatever they made him do, and he did that just fine. He said, I told you I wasn't drinking. He says, okay, well, hold on. Can you blow into this breathalyzer for me? My dad does that, and he fails miserably. Officer was nice enough to ask my dad, hey, you want me to cuff you in front or behind the car? My dad said, behind the car so my son won't see. By this time, guys, I'm out of my seatbelt, and I'm crying, looking at my dad be arrested. I'm screaming, it's just Kool-Aid. It's just Kool-Aid. Five years old, guys, I had no idea that my dad spiked that, that Kool-Aid with vodka, putting my life in danger. See, I had no control over this, just like I had no control over Dylan Roof, who was misled and mistaught by somebody. 21 years old that was misinformed, walked into my church with hate in his heart, and he had murder on his mind because somebody taught him not to look at people that look like me, not to speak to people that look like me. And so he had all this built-up hate and anger from being mistaught, had no control over him walking into my church, firing 70-plus bullets into my church. 50 of those entering bodies in my church while people were praying. Six of those hit my mom right here, taking her breath and her life away forever. No control over this day. None of it. And I think there's so many things in our lives that we have no control over and we lose hope. But let me tell you to never lose hope in the Lord. I'm telling you right now. Because although we don't have control over what happens sometimes, we always have a choice in how we respond and how we react. 
There's a quote that I always share every time I speak. It's by Charles Swindle. He said, 10% of your life is action. The other 90 is reaction. And when I heard that, I couldn't help but think, you know, 10% of your life is just given to you. Your name, unless you change it, your age, the year you were born, your parents, nobody picks their parents, right? So many things are given to you, but that's your 10%. The 90% is the way you respond. How do you live the rest of your life? If you grew up rich, how do you respond to growing up rich? If you grew up poor, how do you respond to growing up poor? You see, my 10% was my alcoholic father. That was my 10%. My 10% was my mom being murdered because of the color of her skin. That was my 10%. But my 90, I will never become an alcoholic like my dad. That's my 90. My 90 is, is speaking around this country to churches, schools, bringing people together, letting them know that although we may look different on the outside, on the inside, we're just the same. My 90 is speaking to people, letting them know that nobody chooses their skin color. So why would I hate you for yours, and why would you hate me for mine? That's my 90%. And when it, my 90% was also forgiveness. And when, I, when everybody asked me, Chris, you know, how do you forgive a day after your mom was murdered? That's the number one question that I always get. You know, how do you do it? How did you do it? And I told Pastor Kinzer I wasn't alone. I know for a fact I wasn't. I describe it as, you know, being on cruise control. Remember, you know, getting down there to the place where they wanted to do an interview and I said the words, love is always stronger than hate. I remember getting down there, talking to our, our chaplain at the school. I said, hey, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. He said, well, let's pray. And we prayed and I said, God, I don't know what you want me to do. I don't know what you want me to say, but can you say it for me? And that's when I said the words, love is always stronger than hate. So if we just love the way my mom would, the hate won't be anywhere close to where love is. And I think that's so powerful because we, we get caught up in things today and everything is so hateful. You know, sometimes we watch the news and it's 45 minutes of stuff that's bad and then we have a one minute feel good session. But I want you to know that one minute is powerful. Love is so much stronger than hate. And when I think about me and forgiveness, I can't help but think about the ultimate forgiveness. And I was given that, 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 that painting or that picture, and it's so crazy because I was thinking about that last night. I don't think that was an accident that I got it today. So I thank you for getting that for me, for sure. Thank you so much. And I think about the ultimate forgiveness. I think about Jesus on the cross, like the picture I was given. I think about Luke 23, 34, when he says, you know, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they're doing. As he's on the cross, as people are blaspheming him, you know, gambling for his clothes, mocking him, all these things. And he has a forgiveness and he has the love in his heart to say, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they're doing. So now if you were to ask me, Chris, you know, how do I forgive? If you're a believer, I'll say, how do we not forgive when we're already forgiven? So many things in this life that, that we don't deserve and we've been given. So let us never stop forgiving because we're already forgiven. The last thing I want to share with you guys, is something I learned myself, and I learned it about a year ago. You know, we always hear, you know, Chris, just pray about it. Just pray about it. And I would. I would pray about it, but I found out there's this thing called PTSD, and I thought PTSD was only for people that were in the military. I thought people would go fight in Vietnam or Afghanistan, Iraq, and they'd come back and they hear noises or whatever it may be. I thought it was for people that was only in combat, that kind of thing. I didn't know it was real for regular people like you and me. I remember after my mom was killed, my dad was struggling real bad. He was drinking real bad. And I remember I would have these dreams. And in these dreams, you know, I would be in the room. My mom's getting murdered. And I'd be holding her 
as she's been shot, and she doesn't want me to see her pass, and so she would turn her head away from me, and I would pull her back towards me, and instantly, a father would appear dead in my arms. And I would wake up, and I would cry, and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't know what to say, and I would cry, and I would have these dreams, and one night, I had the same dream. My mom was dying in my arms. She looked away. I pulled her back towards me. Instantly, my father appeared, and I woke up and I prayed. I prayed from night till morning. I didn't know, quite honestly, how much I, how long I prayed. I wish I had a stopwatch on me so I could tell everybody, hey, if you pray this long, it'll work. I wish I knew. But I knew I prayed so long, and the, after that night, I've never had that dream ever again. So now when people ask me, Chris, does prayer work? I know I say, yes, it does. I'm living proof that it does. If it hasn't worked yet, you got to keep praying. Pray longer, pray stronger, pray harder. Because prayer definitely works. I'm going to leave you guys with a quick story. I tell this story at my, to my high school students that I speak to all the time. I know we probably got probably low, running low on time, so I'm going to be quick. I promise, okay? I promise. And this story was given to me by one of my best friends. And I was feeling real down at the time, and I was struggling. My dad was, was dead. My mom had been murdered. And my buddy said, hey, Chris, I'm going to tell you about a, a story about a golf ball. We got any good golfers in here? Raise your hand if you're a good golfer. We got one brave soul over there. She raised her hand. <laughs> I'm terrible at it. Awful. If somebody said, Chris, I'll give you a billion dollars if you can hit this one straight. You know what happened? I'd hit it, and it sliced right every time. <laughs> and so I'm terrible at golf. My friend starts telling me this story. He said, it's the history behind a golf ball. I said, all right, man, cool. What, what is it? He says, okay, when they first made in the 14th century, it was called a feathery made out of molasses, super smooth, all the way around. I said, okay, cool. He says, whenever they hit it, it was super light, so whenever they hit it, whichever way the wind was blowing, whew, it would take it that way. I said, well, you know, that tends to happen when the wind's blowing. He says, but you know, we're human, we're smart. So we adapt, we evolve, we make things better. He said, so we put some more substance behind it. We made it heavier. He says, this time when they hit it, it was smooth all the way around. So when they hit it, it would go a little bit further, but still whichever the way the wind was blowing, it would just take it that way. He says, it wasn't until we had a beat-up golf ball that was all messed up and had rubber bands on it, and they thought it was trash. He says, you know what? They gave this one a try. And this time when they hit it, it was able to cut through the wind. He says those punctures and those rubber bands, the things that made it not so beautiful on the outside is what helped it cut through the wind. He said, you're like that golf ball, Chris. You've been beat up. You've gone through things nobody should ever go through. People have said things to you that hurt. Nobody should hear them. But you know what? I think those things that you've gone through make you stronger. I think he was right. He says those things make you cut through the future adversity in your life. And when I heard that, I wanted to go see if that's in the Bible somewhere. Because sometimes when somebody says something, like, dang, that sounds super smart. It's got to be in the Bible somewhere. So I went to go looking, and I found this. It was Romans 5, 3 through 5. And it says, rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And, I, and immediately I got it. You know, he was right. So I'm not saying every time I go through something, I'm smiling. No, I'm not. That's not human. So you see somebody that's doing that, hey, I don't know what's going on, but that's not human. So when I go through something, of course it's tough. But I know that it makes me stronger as a person and as a believer. So now, whether we had a great start to our year, I know we're in February. It's the, the Pats won the Super Bowl. We might have some mad people in here. So we're having a great start to our year, a terrible start. Maybe we're having a great day, a terrible day. Let us never forget to rejoice 
in this day because this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us always rejoice. Whether good or bad, let us be glad in it. Thank you guys so much. But let's all say amen. 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 <laughs> all right. It is our pleasure to welcome the uh, choir from Shiloh AME Church as they share uh, a gift of through music. So please. And I don't know what I'll be doing ten years from now. I just don't know. But I'll be I'll be singing or teaching God's holy words and going in my heart in my heart to serve the Lord. Now I'll be in death in my heart to serve the Lord. It's in my heart. It's in my heart. Oh, my God. 